Good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining the Man Who Planted Trees book discussion, How a French Parable Inspires Ecological Restoration. I am Lisa Carrico, Director of Family and Veteran Programs for the Missouri Humanities. We are a member-supported organization, and our mission is dedicated to enriching lives and strengthening communities by connecting Missourians with the people, places, and ideas that shape our society. I'm pleased to introduce our two guest presenter for this evening's program, Dr. Robert S. Emmett and Dan Burkhart. Robert S. Emmett has taught humanities courses examining the human role in shaping the natural world for over a decade. Dr. Emmett is the author of Cultivating Environmental Justice, Environmental Humanities with David E. Nye, and the edited volume of Future Remains, a Cabinet of Curiosities for the Anthropocene. After working at the Rachel Carson Center for Environment and Society in Munich, Germany, Dr. Emmett returned to his hometown of Blackburg, Virginia, where he currently works at Virginia Tech and serves as Assistant Director for Global Engagement in the College of Engineering. Dan Burkhart is the owner of Bethlehem Valley Farm and Vineyards and the co-founder of two St. Louis-based advocacy organizations, the Katy Land Trust, which conserves land along the Katy Trail State Park, and Magnificent Missouri, which supports land conservation, historic preservation, and economic development within the last 100 miles of Missouri River Valley. Dan is also the co-author of Growing Up with the River, Nine Generations on the Missouri, and author of a very special foreword in Magnificent Missouri's special edition of The Man Who Planted Trees. In this program, we will explore The Man Who Planted Trees, an ecological tale of one shepherd's arduous effort to successfully reforest a desolate valley in the foothill of the Alps. As we consider a timeless classic can be a parable to modern times and how the humanities can influence the way we think about the environment. Whether you're watching on Zoom or Facebook Live, we invite you to be part of the conversation, so much so that we will invite you to answer two questions for us. On Zoom, please submit your questions to Robert and Dan using the Q&A button and use the chat button to submit your answers to our questions. If you're on Facebook, please let us know you're watching by asking questions and leaving comments. At the end of the presentation, we'll try to answer as many of these questions as possible. If you enjoy this program and would like to learn more about the Missouri Humanities, please check us out on Facebook and on our website. We also have a membership program where benefits include free books, discounted tickets to special programs, and access to member-only events. Joining is easy. Visit mohumanities.org and click Become a Member. At the conclusion of the program, a link to our program survey will pop up on your screen. We would really appreciate if everyone watching could take a few minutes to provide feedback on tonight's presentation. The feedback helps shape future programs. Without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Emmett. Thank you and welcome. Thank you so much, Lisa. And I want to thank Lisa and also Dan and the wonderful people at Missouri Humanities, but also Dr. Katie Gilbert, who's the director of the Humanities and Ethics Center at Drury University, who put us in contact. This is really a great example of how important the arts and humanities are for bringing people together around important conversations. Um, I really think that the stories that we tell matter a great deal, um, and we're going to have some time and opportunities for engagement this evening where we ask some questions uh, of you, and we'll be using the chat and the, and the Q&A features uh, to do that. But I think that the stories that we tell matter because they actually help us frame our life choices, they help structure our unconscious behaviors, they also inform our habits of, of thought and our feelings about the environment. Um, and if we're able to have more open conversations across differences, if we're able to take the invitation that's offered by beautiful works of literature like The Man Who Planted Trees, then we can connect with each other. So I think the creative arts can help us to do that, and that can give us hope when we desperately need it. And I think in the current situation with so many grave ecological challenges ahead of us this century, of an unstable climate, of geopolitical struggles that are around climate change and some resource scarcities that face us. Um, we really need sources of hope and we, we need the kind of moral vision 
that you see in this beautiful parable. So tonight we're going to be discussing a parable, a, a short realistic fictional tale that uses symbols and an extended comparison to teach a general truth about the potential that we all have to improve the environment. We're probably, many of us have grown up in, if you grew up in the United States, then you probably grew up hearing declensionist narratives, stories about decline, stories about the destructive force that certainly we can as society have on the natural world. And we certainly have had that impact. John Jonot, the author of this text, was not unfamiliar with that destructive impact. I'll give a little bit of context, but I also want to bring us deeply into the text first. I'm going to read some of it. Um, in another life, I was a, an undergraduate studying French, um, as well as, as many other things, and, and had the opportunity to visit many of the landscapes and places where he talks about Mont Ventoux and, and Provence. So I'm going to read a little bit of it in French as well, because, of course, we're getting it in translation. The translation is excellent. It's a beautiful translation published um, by Chelsea Green uh, Publishing. Um, but there's some also a pleasure to hearing Jono's language in, in the original, so I'll share that. So some people have also referred to Jono's story, L'homme qui plante des arbres, as a fable. And I do think it's significant to, to think about the powerful role the inanimate landscape plays in the book. Um, and that's a feature that we most often find in fables where talking animals or inanimate objects where the natural world takes this powerful role. And we certainly see that in the man who planted trees, the landscape of Provence, which was so important to Jono's work um, as, as a novelist, also plays a kind of has a character role in this story as well. So more important though, uh, for our conversation are gonna be the questions that we have for you. So there are two questions that I'm putting up here in advance so you get a chance to think about them. When we open the chat, we'll ask you to put some answers into it. It's not open yet, but we'll come to that slide. And these are just really simple questions. What does this book mean to you? It's a parable, it's a, a moral tale. It's deceptively simple, right? There's a lot of complexity that he packs into this. And then the second question I have for you is how have you seen landscapes change during your lifetime? Jean Genot, was um, living in Provence for most of his life. He's associated with the landscape. He's often in French literature, sometimes classified even as a regional author because he's so closely associated with the region of Provence. Um, but of course, much more important than that because the work that he published in 1953, The Man Who Planted Trees, he also released in open copyright so that it could be translated, it could be shared. Um, and that's why we find ourselves with this beautiful text with illustrations that you see here with woodcuts. And I'm so pleased to be able to share these with you also. Um, so I'm gonna jump right in to the text. So we begin with an unnamed narrator and he begins in this deserted wilderness. He is trekking across the wilderness at the widest point and he runs out of water. The situation's becoming dire. Those of you who are familiar with classical literature, you will find it very familiar, right? He finds himself lost in a wilderness. He says, Je traversais ce pays dans sa plus grande largeur et après trois jours de marche, je me trouvais dans une désolation sans exemple. I found myself in the midst of an unparalleled desolation after three days of walking. He is camping out at the edge of what he calls a skeleton of an abandoned village, right? It's a completely dead landscape. And the situation is becoming dire. He's in the village looking for water at a fountain, right? This is a central feature of this architecture and these clusters of buildings. The middle of the village, you'll find the, the communal well or the fountain where you get water, but it's run dry. Desperate, after five hours, he breaks camp to search for water. And that's where he meets the shepherd. And the moment that he meets the shepherd, you know that this is more than a simple character. There's something powerfully symbolic about the figure of the shepherd. He's, first of all, depicted at the top of a hill, and he's mistaken for a tree. He sees him, and he thinks that actually it's a standing tree, and he's just instinctively, he says, he's drawn to this, this figure. He goes up to it, realizes it's a shepherd. The shepherd, without saying anything, offers him water, right? It's very much, I think those of you who are familiar with biblical parables, you'll also hear the, the resonance there of the well, right? Going to the well and that landscape and offering a stranger a drink of water. It's very powerfully resonant. And, and I think John is definitely aware of that. So what we get is a kind of saint in the wilderness, like this figure of the lone shepherd, who is a kind of holy hermit uh, 
who is going to show the way to the narrator. So they indeed arrive at the man's home and he learns that the man's name is Erzia Bouffier and he's living in this stone cottage that he is described as having put back together, right? Put, put back together stone by stone from an abandoned house. Um, and it was perhaps one of those ruthless wrecks that he first encounters. And then we get this beautiful description of the room's interior. And this actually the etching here that you see is really close to the text. So Bouffier, it's, he's a man who speaks little, right? And, and um, Jono makes a, quite a lot of this, right? He says, this is the way of those who live alone. Um, and yet you feel, Jono says, that he was sure of himself and confident in his assurance. And that was unexpected in this barren country. So the other dimension of this text is that this exceptional character stands out because not only is he in a desolate landscape, but Jono, the narrator, describes how the villages he does know nearby are inhabited by desperate types, right? People who make a living by making uh, charcoal, which of course is cutting down the last remaining trees to then burn them and to produce charcoal, um, and then trundling it for sale in the larger uh, settlements and then coming back. And it, he describes a situation that's desperate because of the land, because of the, the howling winds, the dryness of the landscape, the few resources, and the fact that people are pressed together in these very small villages, living really cheek by jowl. Um, and he says it brings out the worst in people. So what's surprising is that Bouffier seems immune to this. He also learns that he is a widower, right? He's lost his wife, he has lost his son. Um, and in the description, of the, the interior, it's, it's um, I'm gonna read a little more of the French. He says, son ménage était en ordre, sa vaisselle lavé, son, parca, son parquet balayé, son fusil grésé, la soupe bouillie sur le feu. It's just really kind of prosaic, but beautiful description of like everything about his home is orderly. So his dishes are clean. His rifle is oiled, right? The floor is swept. There is a pot of soup boiling on the fire. And then they break bread. So Bouffier is also represented as a kind of unlettered peasant, but clearly not just a peasant, but almost like an orphan god. He's set in the wilds here. He's modest, he's silent. He's as down to earth as possibly can be. Um, and so down to earth, in fact, as I said, the narrator actually mistakes him for a tree when he first sees him. But then what happens the next day, the narrator follows the solitary shepherd as he takes his sheep out to pasture and then watches him as he's methodically planting a hundred acorns that he carries in a pouch at his waist. And the night before, in this wonderful moment of suspense, right, you see him counting out and sorting the acorns. You're like, what is going on here? Right? The narrator is kind of you know, curious about that. And then he sees him plant them. And then he learns that, in fact, he's been planting 100 acorns a day for years and has now planted tens of thousands of oak trees and also beeches and birches. So he also carries this, this staff, right? And it, again, it's like it, it seems to take on a kind of magical quality because the staff he carries isn't an ordinary staff. It's a steel rod that he uses to pierce the hard ground to make holes in order to plant acorns in what is really a barren wasteland. Um, and then this wonderful moment happens where, you know, he first sees him planting the trees and the narrator in 1913 in the, the first passage of the book, he's a young man. And he asks him, it's really a kind of naive question. I asked him if the land belonged to him and he answered no. Um, did he know whose it was? He did not. He supposed it was community property or perhaps belonged to people who did not care about it. He wasn't worried about knowing the owners. He planted his hundred acorns with the greatest care. Um, this is so minimalist, these phrases, but packed into them is a whole worldview that Jono is endorsing. It's really a moral vision here. And it has to do with the care of the earth as a care for a living system, not as blank real estate. It's not just something that people own. In fact, what's more important, and the point that he comes back to again and again, um, is that a truly exceptional character is one who is seeking a benefit for others without egotism, without self-interest, what he calls an unparalleled generosity. Um, and that means planting trees on land you don't even own, you don't know who owns it. I mean, this is really like an abandoned property, right? It's land that nobody is caring for. 
Um, and so what Bouffier, the shepherd does is he cares for it. And that's where we know that we're reading a parable the language, the characters, the landscape, they're all pared down to their essentials. And the moral vision is rooted in these essentials, these everyday actions of the shepherd that we see over a series of decades, 1913 to 1953, when the book is published and the narrator is reflecting back from that moment. And I think it's just wonderful. I just toggled through some of the woodcuts because you also get to see with these woodcuts, it's also kind of a flip book, I think the book, you can actually flip it and you see what's happening in the landscape that he describes so beautifully. So Bouffier has reforested the high country around these villages. And when he does that, of course, the water comes back. And then from these everyday acts of planting trees year after year, it ripples out and these persistent human actions then <clears throat> create changes in the human community. So the water comes back and people come back. And at the end of it, of course, there's this vision of um, the valley is transformed into a real Canaan, right? It's the land of um, the promised land really for everyone. So it takes 40 years to do that uh, from 1913 to 1953. And we get that in a series of these glimpses. And the dates, of course, they're not just symbolic in that kind of moral sense. They also have this historical significance for Jono very much personally as a writer in France. It's 1913, 1918, 1935, 1939, 1945. It's not an accident. Um, the, the, um, the symbolic quality of the text, of course, it, it was so powerful that after the book is published in 1953, enthusiasts in France went looking for the grave of Edgar Bouffier. They wanted to find out, you know, it says he passed away peacefully, he died peacefully at the hospice in Banon. So people started looking for this person. They found actually there's no record of him. That's because, of course, he doesn't exist. He's a, it's a fiction. It's completely, you know, it's, it's created. But it's so believable that people wanted to, to find where Ezia, you know, Ezia Bouffier was, was, um, was buried. Um, so we can read this as allegorical, but then, of course, we can read this as very much um, a commentary as well on the historical context. Um, and that historical context for Jono was very much rooted in his experiences as an infantryman in the First World War. Um, two photographs here that are in um, Creative Commons licensed from the Battle of Verdun in 1915, where uh, Jean Geno was an infantryman with the company from Haute Provence. Um, most of the company is killed in this battle. It lasts 10 months, uh, 165,000 plus. French troops killed, um, more German troops than that, killed in this battle for, of 10 months. Um, and it's that landscape of complete desolation, what it does to the countryside that really haunts Jono. It's what makes him become a pacifist when he returns home to Provence after the war. It's what makes him continue to be a pacifist even through the 1930s. And you can see that inflected also in the text, right? He has a deep suspicion of the state, a deep you know, suspicion of the effects of, of the war. Um, and we get this, this passage in the text when he comes back in 1918 and he makes a, a visit and meets the shepherd again, the narrator. And he, the narrator you know, describes how the shepherd showed me handsome clumps of birch that he planted five years before, that is 1915, when he had been at, fighting at Verdun, just like Dono himself. So this book is also about a search for meaning. It's about a search for redemption and sources for hopefulness when you have perhaps reason to, to have lost hope. And Jono is also controversial because he was a pacifist up until the beginning of the Second World War. He was jailed by the French government before the war and after the war. Um, and of course, like many French authors, you know, there's, there's a taint associated with anyone who wasn't the kind of on the model of the engaged intellectual, like some of the better known authors like Sartre and, and Camus. Um, but more than anything, he's attached to his beloved Provence in the landscape and wanting to protect it and preserve it. Um, and that's what we see in this text. So now we've arrived at the moment when I want people to use the chat and tell us what does the book mean to you? And, and also how, how have you seen landscapes change during your lifetime? And and there is one question, there's a question in the Q&A that I think will we get to the Q&A a little bit later. Okay, there's a wonderful question there about this in the Little Prince. 
So don't be shy. If you're able to, if you're able to use the chat now, we'd love to hear your thoughts about what the book means to you. And also, how have you seen landscapes change in your lifetime? I see Rob's comment with a message of hope and inspiration. You take small actions, they can have lasting impacts with ripple effects. Absolutely. Absolutely. gives hope that young people will be awakened to the value of nature and they can help conserve it. Yeah, absolutely. That's absolutely true. I, I hadn't, I hadn't thought of that. I think David's comment is really important. I hadn't thought about it. It's an intergenerational context to the dynamic, right? Jono starts the book as a young man. He meets this older shepherd who's in his fifties at the beginning of the book. I love that description now that I'm, I'm middle-aged myself. And I'm, I often think about like how age is relative. He talks about how like anyone in their fifties, to this 20 year old self, you know, it seems ancient, it seems like they've, you know, survived and they're aged, but of course uh, he's hail, he's in the prime of his life at the beginning of the book. I think I only read this book last, it inspires hope that individuals can have a great influence on their environment. Absolutely, absolutely. Sense of peacefulness and tranquility. Uh, yes, it makes it a pleasure to read. It's a very, yeah, it's a very quiet book. You know, it's a very quiet book. I love this comment by, by Stephen Roberts. I grew up in Northeast Missouri and fence rows of trees growing along them ever so gradually the trees were moved today. The fence rows are relatively bare. Absolutely, I think of those fence rows or the lone wolf trees as part of that vernacular landscape. It's the landscape of farming. You always kept trees on your fence row to create both to slow, sometimes to slow the wind across your field so it didn't dry out as fast, but also so you had a place to rest in the shade. That's the wolf trees that mark the corners will often use that way. That's great. It's a beautiful story that gives hope for one. Just look at West County and see all the buildings removal of green spaces. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Very, very intense, very intense comments. Dan. I think we've got some questions that we're going to get to next with Dan Burkhart. I see you also have your hand up, Dan. Did you? No, I'm ready for a question. You're ready. Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. I'm, I'm ready to, to ask them. Um, so we um, we're so lucky that we're joined by, by Dan Burkhart tonight. And um, I've got a few questions that I want to ask you. I mean, of course, the first question is what the book uh, also means to you and how you came to it, how you came to produce this beautiful new edition with Chelsea Green Publishing. Well, I came across this book about 20 years ago, and I, I read it and I never forgot it. And I bought dozens of copies to give to friends to provide what we hope was some inspiration for tree planting and improving the world. And we've just begun at Magnificent Missouri, a major tree planting effort along the Katy Trail. And I've got some great partners in this effort, uh, Meredith Perkins at Forest Relief and a couple arborist friends of mine, Bill Spradley and Mike Rood. And they know a lot more about trees than I do. And they're as excited about this project as I am. And we needed something to be a focal point for this major tree planting effort that we're beginning along the Katy Trail. And we are starting with hundreds of trees. We hope it turns into thousands of trees. We wanted to give people inspiration and I couldn't think of a better way to do it than by doing a special edition of this book. And I called Chelsea Green Publishing and they liked the idea and we printed uh, a number of copies that are distributing them to talk about not only our tree tree planting project along the Katy Trail, but uh, the Shepherd's project in the Alps and the obstacles he overcame. And we think there couldn't be a better way to kick off our effort than by focusing on this book. Dan, can you talk a little bit about the, the land along the Katy Trail where you want to plant more trees? Because it's, I'm really curious about like, you know, the, the area in, 
the man who planted trees it's so mountainous and dry and remote it's it's very depopulated but what's it like along the Katy Trail where you're planting well it's the opposite of that it's green and lush and uh a wide river valley surrounded by uh, wooded bluffs, but it has suffered from some of the same impacts that are, are discussed in, in this book, obviously not as severe, but uh, the area has, has gone from a heavily forested river bottom when <laughs> Lewis and Clark first found it to something that's been uh, cleared first for steamboat fuel then for agriculture, and then the immediate corridor along the Katy Trail for the Katy Railroad. Hmm. Trees were not really compatible with railroads. So what the railroad wanted was a, a clear shot along this flat river valley to build their rails. And they got that by removing all of the large trees. As you mentioned earlier, you can look out into this broad river valley and see some lone wolf trees. We call them line trees because they mark the line fences there. Uh, generally big bur oaks or pecans, but they're, they're aging and they're dying. And we want to replace those as much as we can along the right away of the trail, working with Missouri State Parks. We want to plant the future generations of these large river bottom trees that once covered the entire valley. So we think that uh, this project can bring shade to the Katy Trail. It can bring biodiversity, it can bring habitat. But one thing that anyone who's ever ridden that trail knows that is on a hot summer day, you'd like some shade. So yes. we hope uh, we can provide that in the coming years for this project. Yeah, and I, I see already someone in the chat has asked about, is there a way to come out and help plant trees on, on the Katy? So that's wonderful. I knew there'd be people who also would want to get involved and get their hands dirty like that because it is so satisfying. Um, I know you want to plant trees in various locations along the trail, and it's 280 miles long in its total length, right? But you've also, you're creating this kind of small arboretum and really focus also on native trees, which I think is, is particularly cool because there's so many wonderful native trees in the Missouri Valley and in the Eastern United States as well. But like smoke trees and fringe trees, you mentioned pecans, pawpaws. Um, so can you tell us about the, the arboretum that you, that you plan to plant? Yes, we, uh, the Katy Trail, 280 miles long and it has 28 individual trailheads along it. People places where people can park and congregate and take off on a bike ride. And at one of those trailheads in Trelor, about an hour west of St. Louis, we've established a, a small planting right across from the trail of uh, a dozen different varieties of native Missouri River Valley trees, including all of them that you mentioned. Uh, and we planted a little larger trees there. The trees will be planting along the trail are generally smaller trees, two to three feet tall. We wanted to plant something in this little arboretum that uh, gives a little more immediate uh, scale to these trees and what they can become. And uh, we hope that when people visit there and they see those trees, they'll become a little more attuned to what they're seeing along the trail. When they see our little bur oak that was planted from an acorn 10 years ago and see what it looks like today, about a 10 or 12 foot tall tree. And then they can think about this beautiful image that you put up of the McBain Borough, mm -hmm. a 350 year old tree near Columbia that yeah. uh, Lewis and Clark could have seen as just a, a small 150 year old tree when they came by. So we wanna give people at the Trees of Tree Lore Project, a little look at what they're going to see as they ride the trail and they see our plantings. The first one was just down the trail from this last March in Dutso, Missouri. We planted 50 trees there. We've got another 50 to 75 planned for this fall and many more for uh, next year. So I know that there are people 
who have joined the discussion who also want to help plant trees. So what can they do? How can they get involved, those who are watching, listening? Yeah, well, the first thing they can do is go to our website, sign up for our emails. We let people know when we're going to have an event. We have a number of events out along the trail because inspired by the man who planted trees and other similar books, we think the best kind of conservation is conservation by storytelling. So everything we do, we, we try to tell a story, whether it's planting a tree or planting a prairie or having an event of historic uh, significance. We want to engage people uh, on the ground along the trail. And the best way to find out about that is to sign up for our emails and uh, notifications on the website. We're having an event, uh, Prairie Walk for Kids on July 24th. And also I'll put in a plug for something else that the Missouri River Valley grows very well in addition to bur oaks and sycamores. It grows sweet corn. And we're gonna have uh, the first uh, Magnificent Missouri Sweet Corn Fest uh, at the Tree Lore Trailhead on August 15th. So information about that will be uh, coming out uh, and will be posted on our website as well. I really, I love networks like this because there are face-to-face -face networks, right? And you can get on the email list, but then more importantly, you can come out and actually meet your neighbors and your neighbors in the broader sense, like up and down the valley and along the trail. Um, and Dan, you, you, you've been very modest and you haven't spoken about your beautiful book, um, Growing Up on the River, which um, we got the cover here um, and just fantastic, fantastic illustrated book uh, with short stories. And really, I think of it also as a, a work of environmental history. Um, and I've been enjoying it. My 12-year-old my daughter has also been reading it with me and we've been talking about it. It's been a wonderful way to talk about the presence of Native Americans in landscape, the disappearance of the Carolina parakeet, which she had never heard of, right? Which you show also in the illustration on the cover, which is just a um, wonderful example of the stories that you share. Um, and again, why they're so powerful. Um, so I think we're, we're gonna move along now and, and I'm not sure if we're ready for the full open Q&A. We're gonna get to that in a second, but we had some other questions that I know uh, I think Lisa wanted to, to ask. And um, I'm gonna turn it back over to Lisa. Thank you, Robert. Um, thank you for the engaging conversation so far uh, between you and Dan and with our audience. Uh, somebody did just reply about uh, Dan's book, I believe. The story takes me back to my childhood and how trees have been a source of happiness for me. The sound of wind rustling through the cottonwoods, climbing a glorious tree and seeing the landscapes in a different way, enjoying ripe mulberries before the birds eat them all. So I just wanted yeah. to share that with you. Um, before we kick off some questions um, with the audience, so if you do have questions, make sure to put them in the Q&A that'll help us find them faster. Um, I had a few questions for you. Um, so The Man Who Planted Trees was written more than 65 years ago. Robert, I'm curious, uh, what is the resonance of this book today in 2021? So I'm gonna actually take us back to a, a slide before this. And, and when I'm answering this question, I'm gonna take us back to the century before the book is published, which is the 19th century, in the middle of the 19th century. And one thing I didn't say is John Geno's ecological model, right? What he shows happening in the book, it's completely accurate. It is possible through reforesting highlands and areas that have been deforested to bring back the flow of water by bringing back the soil right? And the trees are holding that soil and holding the moisture in the soil um, and to restore environments. But it was known for a century before the book was published and actually even earlier than that. And I think one of the master works that really uh, exposes this is the book Man and Nature by George Perkins Marsh, who was Abraham Lincoln's ambassador to Italy. And that book's published in the Civil War, right? In 1864, which is probably one of the many reasons why it's not a very well-known book. But this book is 
putting all the pieces together in terms of analyzing the effects of deforestation and not just on destabilizing soils, which Marsh was based in Italy. He knew what was happening in Europe. He knew what was happening in Provence and the Alpine regions. And so did the French government and the forestry department. Um, but what interested George Perkins Marsh, and what I think makes this book so important now, is that Marsh saw this as a social catastrophe, right? If, if the natural world is damaged beyond repair, um, if in fact nature is not inexhaustible, as many people in the 19th century thought, then that would have a destabilizing effect on society. And that's where I think this book is relevant for us today, because we're in a century where there are going to be tough trade-offs and choices because of our past use of the natural world. Nature isn't inexhaustible anymore. And we know we've learned these painful lessons, right? That when the forest is gone, you lose the soil. And when you lose the soil, you can create landscapes that look like the surface of the moon, right? And as the temperatures are increasing on average around the world, more and more places are looking like this. Um, I know I have family in California and Oregon last week with temperatures you know, hitting 130 in Death Valley. The intensity of the heat really means that we face some tough choices in difficult, difficult pressure and situation. And that's where I think this book is, is extremely important. And we're also, it's a book also that's really about connecting, right? It's a book that holds up the shepherd as this kind of symbol for kind of quiet, modest, persistent work. He is not interested in politics and ideology. He is not engaging in you know, argument. He's just every day going out and planting trees, like making the world better little by little every day in persistent ways. And over time, that creates this incredible effect. And I think that too really speaks to our moment where we're so divided by so many differences and we can easily find ourselves in that kind of psychological space of being in the wasteland where Jono's narrator begins the book. So this is so vital today and it's just really important to find the sources of hopefulness and embrace examples of good work. Um, so Jono reminds us that we have the capacity to do that. Like we can do this. And I think, you know, so important today. Thank you, Rob. Um, Dan, do you have anything you want to add to that or? Well, what I'd like to add is I've spent a lot of time reading and thinking about these things. And I had never heard of George Perkins Marsh until, uh, Rob brought him up in our conversation earlier this week. And I, I just want to uh, say that it's it's been a real pleasure to to work with him on this project because it's not often that you get such a perfect match of of capabilities someone who's a french scholar and an environmental expert uh, and can bring into the conversation uh, something like a book that was written during the civil war that points out things that 160 years later we're uh, still grappling with. Uh, so I, I, I've learned a lot from being on this panel. Awesome, yeah, thank you, Robert and Katie Gilbert, if you're still out there um, <laughs> watching, thank you for the connection to Robert. It's been a great joy and pleasure to have this conversation um, and present this program. Uh, so I have another question for um, you both. Um, something that we addressed at the beginning of this program is the role of the humanities in shaping the way we think about the environment. Um, Robert, especially in your experience, can fictional stories influence how people utilize and care for their lands and the natural environment? I think absolutely they can. And not just fictional narratives, of course, but also stories, biographical, autobiographical stories. Um, we know that John Genot himself, he's deeply influenced by reading American authors, actually. He was a, a great avid reader of Thoreau, of Henry David Thoreau and Walden, um, and admired his vision of the natural world. He was also a great reader of Walt Whitman and the kind of organic vision of humanity's place in the natural world that you get in Walt Whitman's poetry. So certainly like reading works of powerful imaginative fiction and poetry, um, you know, attending theater, there have been studies that have shown that attending theater has a kind of local and immediate effect on our imagination, our ability to connect with others. And there have also been studies that show there's a sustained impact of reading fiction on our capacity for empathy. And that I do think is really key because at the end of the day, 
the way we utilize and care for our lands is really about how we treat each other. You know, how we treat the natural environment is about how we care for our home. If it's not our home, it's someone else's land that they're not caring for, perhaps, but that is, you know, in a broader sense, our home. And I do think that absolutely reading works like John Jono's book um, can improve our ability to, to take care of that land, certainly. Dan, I'm really curious what you think about this, too. I mean, you mentioned the, the powerful role that stories play in Magnificent Missouri and the work you're doing. Yeah, I, I think that uh, we are real believers in what the humanities can do to bring people to issues like this. Uh, when we started Bank of Missouri, our goal was to engage people on many levels and to, to bring people to the conversation that were interested in art and history and historic preservation and music and a variety of things that weren't related strictly to conservation. And I think we've, we've done that. With the book, Growing Up With a River, we used the artwork, original artwork of one of Missouri's great artists, Brian Haynes, to depict cultural and historic moments in the times in, along the Missouri River since Lewis and Clark. And people that don't have a top level interest in conservation became very interested in that book because of Brian's paintings. At the Piers store, uh, an old general store that we have along the Katy Trail that we use as what we call a conservation outpost, we have bluegrass music on weekend afternoons. And so we like to say that people come for the music and we hope they stay for the conservation but it's, it's a way to get people who might not necessarily uh, categorize themselves as conservationists or environmentalists or, or someone with a uh, uh, real interest in, in those issues to come to a conversation about how we're, we got where we are today. Growing up with a river talks about nine generations of children who grew up in Missouri River communities. And they saw the river change. They saw the landscape change around them. They saw uh, forests cleared and levees built and crops planted and floods come and go. And that march of history is, is something that we want people to be aware of. And, and we think of uh, children and uh, their parents and grandparents become more aware of how history has flowed literally and figuratively along the Missouri River, uh, we'll make better choices in the future. Uh, excellent. Um, so we actually have a few questions related to other literature, other books. So we'll go ahead and ask those questions. Um, Dan or Robert, feel free to, free to jump in. Um, there's a question about, have you read American Canopy? How do you see the value of fiction versus nonfiction in stimulating the environmental efforts? I have not read American Canopy. I have not read that. I'm adding it to my reading list. There's a number of wonderful books written about uh, forests in the United States. Um, Richard Powers' novel from a few years ago, The Overstory, is one that I often think about where there's a, a veteran, a Vietnam veteran in, the, in that novel who comes back and plants trees, kind of furiously is planting trees. And it's part of his overall process for healing, right? Um, and in part, because he's also felled many trees. He'd worked as a logger before he um, fights in Vietnam. So Richard Powers' book, um, The Overstory is one I admire a lot, but I haven't read American Canopy. I know um, I have a, you know, a colleague in environmental history, Jared Farmer, who's written a few books about trees in North America. So I definitely recommend Jared Farmer's works. Um, and then the records of indigenous people in Missouri planting trees, the trees themselves are records. That's the beautiful thing. So we know by the extent of certain types of trees that are in places historically where they would not otherwise be in terms of their ecology absent human activity that 
indigenous populations were responsible for planting many trees, especially fruit bearing trees like persimmon and pawpaw, but also trees in the white oak species that have more edible acorns that have less tannin acid in them and can be used to make flour. So um, chinkapin is an example of chinkapin what, that's in the white oak family and it was planted widely. Um, but in that broad sense, right, of the, of the valley, of the region, and also in the, in the broader Midwest, um, there are, of course, some historical records, descriptions um, by, um, oh, I'm, I'm afraid I'm blanking on the name, but 18th century texts that describe some of the, the European visitors to the Southeast in particular, and they didn't get quite, I guess they did get pretty close to St. Louis um, and described in some cases like orchards and plantings of trees made by Cherokee and other um, native populations in the Southeast. So absolutely indigenous peoples had a major role in planting and in shaping the forest using fire, also planting favorable species. So it's a terrific question in the chat. And I have read American Canopy and it is an amazing book and it's got some of the most, most inspirational and some of the saddest tree stories I've, I've ever read. And I'd also throw out to the group, if you're interested in a, in a, a really remarkable tree book set in a, a, a place other than the Missouri River Valley, it's uh, the Golden Spruce. It's a story about uh, some, someone who uh, uh, became uh, emotionally unhinged in, in, a, in a serious way uh, about his environmental interests. And it's just a remarkable story and had a lot of new information for me about uh, it's set in, in uh, uh, British Columbia. Uh, it's a true story, uh, but uh, wonderful, wonderful for anyone who loves trees. And I did answer the question about the value, the relative value of fiction versus nonfiction and stimulating environmental efforts. And um, I, I want to actually come back to something Dan said earlier, where he was talking about the role that the um, like visual art plays in sort of reaching different people who have gotten involved with Magnificent Missouri and Brian Haynes' paintings being really powerful. Um, you know, I I think of the, the question of genre and its effects as being one that's very relative to audience. And when it comes to audience, I think about the plurality of our, you know, of people and the different ways we learn, neuroplasticity, neurodiversity. So I think it may seem like a cheap answer, but the, but the reality is fiction, nonfiction, visual art, interactions like this that are audio they reach different parts of our, our brains. They reach different people in different ways. I know engineers who are passionate readers of poetry, and I know English professors who barely read anything other than nonfiction anymore. So it, I would say that it's, you know, it's more about the pragmatic implementation of particular books and choosing the powerful books that speak to particular issues and finding that match that motivates right action, right? So that's where I think Jonah is like this, this text is spot on, it's such a beautiful project to connect it so directly to a project like this. Thank you, Rob. Um, I'm just kind of looking through some of these questions. Um, Dan, maybe this is a question for you if um, you have noticed a difference, but somebody, Missouri has this rich German heritage. Um, are the forested areas in Missouri that are populated by German immigrants noticeably different than those by non-German immigrants? That's interesting. Yeah, of course, the, the Missouri River Valley uh, is right in the track of the Missouri Humanities Council's uh, German Heritage Corridor, which was the focus of German immigration here. And uh, certainly uh, there were a lot of uh, oak and walnut trees felled to make uh, log cabins and build barns uh, uh, throughout the 1800s and early 1900s. Um, what our area in the river valley generally avoided was the, the clear cutting of course, that happened in the Ozarks because the Ozarks were covered with pine forests, uh, and uh, that that all went very quickly. Uh, but 
areas north of the Missouri River and south of Highway 70, for those of you familiar with that area, were pretty much cut over for railroad ties uh, during that period. So net, net, I don't know that there was a, a great difference. I think generally the areas along the Missouri River avoided the clear cutting that happened in the Ozarks, uh, but it happened in some selected places. And I don't know if you can trace that to any Germanic influence or not. Do you have, I, I'm super curious about this, this question actually, and I'm really curious if there are flowering chestnuts that German immigrants planted um, in any areas or if that has been, you know, the, the question can be taken kind of broadly at the forest level and you can also take it at the individual tree level where we know like other groups of immigrants who came to the US often brought plants with them and they would plant, they would plant the seeds as a way to make, you know, feel at home here, right? From all, all around the world, including enslaved people who would smuggle seeds in, you know, in, in the braids of their hair, just to have, because they were so attached to the places they came from. So, so I am really curious about that. If, if they're, you know, if they plant flowering chestnuts, I associate that with um, German immigrants from Bavaria. But anyway, I'm I'm not sure. familiar with that, Rob. I've not seen any flowering chestnuts, but I will say there's a, a very large ginkgo tree that was planted in the 1860-1870 era in Herman, Missouri, uh, that's uh, right next to a, a, a large brick house. And uh, ginkgos were imported and brought here by uh, a lot of people, and uh, including some of those along the Missouri River. Excellent. Um, I am going, you know, thanks to everybody so far that asked questions. Um, I did want to share just a couple comments um, from participants uh, from Buzz. Capturing the imagination of young future arborists is key. Planting trees will, of course, be a part of their DNA by doing so. My father inspired me to plant trees. And from Anne, thank you all for this. I love the French. Love the peacefulness of the discussion and the depth. I'd love to help plant trees. Um, so I'm going to turn this back over to you, Robert. Um, so I've had the pleasure to go out and help plant trees with Magnificent Missouri, and I've been taking much more of an interest in it on a personal level. Uh, and of course, I've noticed along on my Facebook page uh, suggested stories with titles like Man Spends 40 Years Planting a Tree on a Barren, barren Island Every Day. Now it's a giant forest. Couple spends 20 years planting an entire forest and animals have returned. So uh, before concluding the program, would you like to talk about uh, landscape transformation on a global scale? And if there's any other questions that may tie into, you're more than welcome to just kind of dive right in. Yeah, and I, I also, I wanted to share the, the the image here of the, the cover of the book that's, that's available to the, the special edition of The Man Who Planted Trees before I kind of take a step back and zoom out and frame this in, in a broader um, perspective, a global perspective even. And, and that is to just reiterate also something that Dan said, which is the stories that we share matter. Stories like The Man Who Planted Trees then have circulated around the globe where they get translated into many different languages and they have an influence. They shape real life actions. And tree planting is something that's been taking place now and has revitalized communities around the world in powerful ways. I know some of you are familiar with the late Wangari Maathai, the Nobel Peace Laureate, uh, who is associated with leading the, um, the Green Belt Movement in Kenya and really using tree planting as a mechanism for revitalizing society, for bringing water back to areas and fighting deforestation, but bringing water back also and firewood and sources of fuel to relieve the burden on women who have to do so much of the work of gathering water and, and fuel. So it's very much like social revitalization taking place through tree planting. Um, some of you probably didn't know that one guy Matai was trained as a graduate student here in the United States in the Midwest at another land grant university a little further north of you in Wisconsin. 
And in this wonderful kind of way that all these things come back together, right? Many of the people in forestry in Wisconsin and Missouri, they were the grandchildren of German immigrants. They had been trained in German forestry techniques. Um, they had examined things in the 1930s, like the impact of planting forest belts, which many farmers had kept in certain areas in places like Wisconsin, um, who tend to practice different farming techniques because of um, the practices they brought with them. Um, and then, you know, learned the power of tree planting for social revitalization and created the Green Belt Movement. Another example is photographer Sebastio Salgado with his wife. They have replanted an enormous area of rainforest, which is now the Terra Institute. It's in the region of Minas Gerais, which is the mining region in Brazil, which is not really known for having lush rainforest anymore. It's really associated with, with large you know, open pit industrial mines. Salgado himself was associated with photographing the workers in places like this giant pit mines. And he found himself so depressed that he actually went back to this landscape, which you see in the photograph in the upper right. It's not a forested landscape when they, they go back and, and start to replant. It's an area that's been in pasture for cattle um, and it was badly eroded. And, but he was just so discouraged after spending his career photographing you know, hard physical labor it was really associated with that, that he went back to this land and with his wife um, set out to do a massive collective effort to replant native trees. And they did successfully create a, a new section of rainforest and then founded this institute. And then some of you may have even seen the exhibit that he then went on to create, which is called Genesis, which is a the most popular single touring photographic exhibit in the world. It's been seen by more people. It toured internationally um, and really tried to photograph and capture the places that do give us hope where there are um, great swaths of vital natural areas that are still out there. And I think also it's a great reminder when we look at these international examples that we all have a role to play and that while the individual story is really significant, it's also coming together. It's also like that photograph that you see there, right? If one person plants 100 trees every day, right? You can imagine like, what is that like? Well, most of us have day jobs. So I know some of you, when you're thinking about this, you're thinking, okay, it's, it's a parable. It's meant to be symbolic, but it's, you know, it's also meant to be lived, but not in a direct way, right? The, that's where the interpretation comes in. A hundred people planting one tree a day, right? Or a thousand people planting a hundred trees over the course of a month. Like it, it, it starts to add up. It starts to be really powerful. Um, and that's where I hope that some people will get involved with Magnificent Missouri. If you're outside Missouri as I am, I'm down here in Southwest Virginia. We certainly have a local land trust. We have lots of projects replanting trees also along abandoned rail corridors, rails to trail projects like the Katy Trail. This is a great important collective work that we can all engage in. And I hope some of you will get involved. So. Um, it's an invitation also, this conversation, to get outside and plant trees. And there's so many great candidates because we have such a wealth of, of options, native trees um, in the U.S. that we can replant. So I hope some of you will, will do that. Thanks, everybody, for joining the conversation. Any final thoughts? It's, we've got a couple minutes here. Dan, if there's anything you would like to add as well in these last few minutes before. Well, I, I just like to say that I think we couldn't have a better example than the last hour's discussion of how the humanities can benefit the environment. And one of our big goals with, I guess, Missouri was to encourage collaboration among organizations. And one of our best collaborators has been the Missouri Humanities Council, who has brought so much in terms of unique perspective and knowledge and information to these discussions. And I think this one tonight with, with Rob uh, would have to be at the top of the list. <laughs> to have somebody with his background and perspective uh, on a global scale, be able to talk with us about what's going on along the Katy Trail and uh, along the Missouri River is, is something of great value. So I hope everyone enjoyed it as much as I did. Thank you so much, Dan. Um, I just want to thank everyone that tuned in tonight. A special thanks to both Dan and Robert for uh, this presentation. Uh, it's been a great joy for me to be a part of this program. Um, 
I've enjoyed uh, reading The Man Who Planted Trees. It was in, I was familiar with the book, but I had never read it in its entirety. So I really have dived deep into it. And it's, this program has helped me think about the context outside of it. So I hope uh, a few people also kind of taken all that history with it. Um, if you would like a copy of Magnificent Missouri Special Edition, you can visit magnificentmissouri.org. Uh, a few people have asked if this will be, uh, it is being recorded and it will be up to view on our website uh, in a few days. It is streaming on our Facebook page. So feel free to rewatch, share. Uh, we've also, I'm hoping that all of your chat is saved at the end of this, but we've also had an amazing amount of book recommendations. So I'm thinking about putting together a book list from this to uh, share in an email. And um, as soon as this concludes, you know, we would love to hear your thoughts on tonight's program. A survey will pop up. Uh, I will also send that survey out in an email with that book list that I just referred to. So uh, if you would like to learn more about programs or like to consider becoming one of our members, please visit mohumanities.org. I hope tonight's program has inspired hope and motivation to get out and plant some trees. Thanks, everyone. Good night.